Got it. That's right. I'm also I'm also I'm, I'm hosting and running the event at the same time. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you so much. So um, so I'm just going to start by uh, sharing what the initial purpose is today. So the official 1898 Observance Committee is hosting this two part series in promotion of the miss our mission statement, which is to serve humanity through reconciliation, education, awareness, reparations, and commemoration of the 1898 massacre and coup d'etat. The 1898 Observance Committee consists of organizations, public officials, concerned citizens, and leaders of all races and backgrounds. It is chaired by Sonia Patrick Amenra. The emeritus is Dr. Bertha Boykins Todd. The massacre took place in 1898 during election time, and the only it is the only American successful takeover in U.S. history. Today's topic will center around racial disparities, elections in 2020, and voter suppression. So let's just take a moment of silence for the victims of the 1898 massacre. Thank you. So today, so uh, just to sum up what happened yesterday, for those of you who weren't here, yesterday we were joined by John Sullivan, the New York Times columnist and journalist who works with a project um, that basically focuses on telling the stories of 1898 from a variety of perspectives. He shared with us uh, something that's very important, which is to tell the story of these heroes who people have forgotten. And who he spoke about was Reverend J. Allen Kirk, who was a preacher and who actually wasn't from Wilmington originally, but married into Wilmington and was a very strong part of the community in 1898. Uh, he, wrote a, he wrote a firsthand account, for those of you who are not familiar with that, that really detailed the impact and the actual, you know, moment by moment massacre on November 10th, 1898. And he was a fascinating individual. We learned so much about him and his own stand for just being the firebrand preacher who is just completely standing up for what mattered to him. And one of the things that mattered to him was interracial relations of all kinds and having people be connected together. He was known for being unafraid of really speaking his views and just telling anybody who would know, who wanted to know, who didn't want to know. And after, to, to sum up that story, at the end of everything that happened in 1898, he actually left with Alex Manley, went north, and they proceeded to share a lot of information. They shared these speeches to talk about the 1898 massacre. I wanted to profile him in this moment to remind us all the power of our voices, the power of us actually being able to say our stories and to not be silenced. So today I am joined by the my, one of my favorite people, <laughs> Dr. Herbert Harris, uh, my father, and a, an amazing individual and native Wilmingtonian we have somewhere in our house, there is a article from 1950 something that says, Port City Youth <laughs> goes to Columbia University. And that was my dad. And I will just share a little bio, a little bit about him before I let him let loose. So Dr. Herbert Harris is an author, speaker and retired attorney. He is a graduate of Columbia University in New York City and has authored numerous books, including How to Make Money in Music, The Golden 12 Universal Rules for Achieving Success, and Power Thoughts for Your Success. His most recent book, Solving the Race Issue in America, has really taken the world by storm this year. 
although it was written 10 years ago and I was there when he sent it to me in manuscript form, it was a departure from what he usually spoke about, which is transformation as a coach. He's a person who's been a speaker and helped a lot of people make a lot of money and make a big difference in the world. However, he turned his mind, his formidable mind <laughs> to the questions and issues of race. And we are so glad that he did because now I am very excited, delighted to have him share with you these observations and the thoughts that he has from so many perspectives from both spiritual, racial, political, and as many else as he cares to have. So Dr. Her Herbert Harris, please take it thank away. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Olivia. Can you hear me clearly? Good, all right. Well, one, I wanna thank you for sharing and, and uh, doing this awesome job. And also wanted to really thank Sonia Patrick, who has been a cornerstone of this community in making things happen. You know, her husband transitioned recently and we are just blessed to and honored to be able to step on, up on her behalf and help to spread the message and let everyone know where we as a city, as a state, as a country, where we are, where we've come from, and my goodness, where we're going. So with that introduction, the, uh, the thought that I'd love to share is one of the preconceptions, you know, when I talk to people around the country uh, especially, you know, I do a lot of interviews, radio and television, and very often the uh, host or some of the people that call in, one of the things that they say is, well, you know, uh, I don't know why Black people are Democrats, because uh, Lincoln was a Republican, and the Republicans uh, were the ones that, uh, you know, literally freed the slaves and all those kind of things. And so, as I share today, we'll be talking about Republicans, but I want to put it all in context. One of the uh, things that happened in the, really, I guess in the late 60s, early 70s, I think with Richard Nixon and that whole period, there came a time when the Republican Party entertained what they call the Southern Strategy. And this happened after the uh, election of President Kennedy. You know, up until that time, the South was strictly Democratic and Democratic to the point of racist Democrats, to the point of even being Dixiecrats. And the civil rights era of the 50s and the 60s, much of it took place in the battleground of the South. And the Democratic Party was the party running things at that time. With the Southern strategy, with uh, the Kennedy years and that whole great society with Lyndon Johnson, many, I think the Republicans at some point determined that there were a lot of white voters in the South who no longer identified with the, Republic, with the Democratic Party. And they literally went out after them and courted them and they came into the Republican Party. And so if you look back historically, uh, uh, great politicians like Strom Thurmond, um, some of those from that 50 and 60s era, and you'll see that period in which the Democrats became Republicans. So I wanted to put that out there because many times that's one of those misinformation things that people talk about. I like to talk, uh, since we're talking about the impact of 1898 and how it all um, really can be transported right up until today, and how so many of the things that happened in 1898 are now happening in a different way. And in a sense, 1898 can be looked at as a, a source, a, a mindset. And 2020 can be looked at as seeing 1898 through the lens of 2020. Because so many of the principles that we see happening right now were the very same ones that happened in 1898. So let me let me just give a little background because one of the mis one of the, you know, you might say one of the um, I'll call it misinformation. You often hear it 
uh, the race riots of 1898, the, the massacre of 1898, the coup of 1898. So let me just set the record straight. This was a coup. This is the only time on American soil that a legitimately elected government was forcefully, was forced to resign and a new government was put in place in their place that was not elected, that was literally put there by force. And so if you say, what is the proper characterization of 1898, it was truly a coup. Second thought is that one of the things we see about 1898 is that it's all about the mind. That the fathers, the founding fathers of the 1898 movement realized that you have to capture people's minds because in their minds, in their, their, their frame of reference, out of that will grow their political philosophy and the actions that they are willing to take in support of that philosophy. So uh, just a, a little background. A lot of what we have is covered in our book, Solving the Race Issue in America. And for those of you who don't have it, it's available on Amazon, uh, the digital version, the paperback version. And you can get it through our website, www.solvingtheraceissueinamerica. But just a little background, before 1898, after the Civil War, you had the Reconstruction. And then around 1876, <clears throat> they're interested in a hotly contested election that was literally decided by the Congress. One of the parts of that agreement was that the troops would be withdrawn from the South. The troops that were maintaining order in the South after the Civil War over a period of time would be withdrawn. And so think about this now. We had just had a Civil War in which more people were killed in the Civil War than in World War II, World War I, and the, uh, the um, what's the one, the Korean War altogether. Over six hundred thousand people, soldiers were killed in the Civil War. So truly, this was something that really affected people's psyche in every respect. The second point is that, as the boys say, and as the young men say in the hip hop, it's always about the money. Follow the money. So after the Reconstruction, that period began to end after 1876, the Republican Party at the time had been the party of Lincoln. The Republican Party had embraced the newly freed slaves. And there were many uh, uh, organizations and institutions, the Quakers, many folks from the North who to help bring them to a point of being citizens, um, full citizens of the United States so that they can enjoy the benefits of uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm sorry, you cut out for just one second and we kind of missed that last sentence. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. So I was saying that there's that period that with the, the Quakers and other, especially religious organizations came to the South to help educate and empower the Negroes so that the freely, the newly freed slaves can now take their place as American citizens. Perfect, thank you. Very good. So now that's taking place. Meanwhile though, there is a shift of power. The, the Republicans in, for example, the election of 1894 and 1896, there grew in Wilmington, something very interesting, and, and in fact, the entire state, there grew a fusion party, which was a collection, an odd collection. I mean, they were integrating all over the place. It was a collection of black Republicans who were now over that period of about 30 years were being educated and empowered. And a group, uh, 
you might say poor white farmers. Many of the farmers had been hurt by the railroad, railroad wars, by the lending practices, by the, the failure of some of the banks. And so the fusion party of poor white people, black people, Republicans, white and black, literally came together. And in the elections of 1894 and 1896 really took a strong position in the government, not only on the local level, but on the state level. The governorship, many of the uh, re representatives and senatorial districts. And so this was the background for 1898. As we say, always follow the money. There were a number of uh, um, uh, financial issues going, some railroad bonds, this thing with industry, et cetera. And so after this election of 1896 and around early 1897, a certain group of Wilmingtonians, and I think this was called the, the Secret Nine, uh, really came together and they said, listen, we have to make a plan to literally take back our state, to find a way to neutralize this coalition between poor whites and blacks and Republicans and take back our state. The interesting thing, when you look at the parallel the fusion party, was, though it had a statewide presence, was strongest on the East Coast around the industrial areas. And the Democratic Party of white people was strongest in the farm areas, in the rural areas. And when you look at the, how this last election went, I think the, the president and that whole group went after that rural area vote. So the same thing happened in 1898, that's the point. So in this background, against this background of a state power going, the, the, that secret nine, the, and we're talking prominent Wilmingtonians, we're talking the business people, made a decision to develop a strategy to take back the country, to take back the state and take back the city. At the time, Wilmington, was actually the largest city in the state. And it had the unique, you might say, characteristic that it was a government of white and black, white and Negro citizens working together. It was a prosperous city. Just think about this, in 1898, the population was roughly 25,000 and about 55% were African-Americans. The Republican Party was biracial in nature. And it really had fostered the election of many Black people to city council, to other positions. As a matter of fact, three of the city's aldermen were Black. Mm -hmm. Of the five members of the uh, Audit and Finance Board, one was Black. Black people were also in positions of justice, of the peace, deputy clerk, street superintendent, coroners, policemen, mail clerks, mail carriers, even the, the, um, the harbor master. Now this is unique. We're talking 1898, folks. This was the model that if it had been fostered instead of destroyed, America would be a different place. So this, uh, this group of nine, the secret nine, they literally devised a plan to take out Wilmington, knowing that Wilmington was like the heart of that whole movement of uh, biracial and justice equality. So think about this again. Wilmington had more of the former slaves were able to use the marketplace now as free men. There were bakers, grocers, dryers. 35% of the service populations were held down by Black people. Black people were moving out of the service jobs into other types of employment where there was a high demand for their skill. Because think about this. As slaves, the Black people had been the carpenters, 
the painters, the plasterers, when you look at the Bellamy Mansion, it tells you it was built by slaves. Look at the White House. The White House was built by slaves. And so at that time, 1898, Black people accounted for 30% of Wilmington's skilled labor, such as mechanics, carpenters, jewelers, watchmakers, painters, plasterers, plumbers, stevedores, blacksmiths, masons. Black people own 10 of the city's 11 restaurants. 90% of the city's 22 barbers were black. One of the city's four fish and oyster dealerships were black. There were more black boot makers, shoemakers than white ones. A third of the city's butchers were black. Half of the city's tailors were black. And Wilmington had two brothers black, the Manley brothers, who owned the Wilmington Daily Record, which is really, I think his story is like the one black daily newspaper in the state and probably in the country. So Wilmington was like the, 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 the the city in the sky. Wilmington really represented what could happen, what America could be like if the, the essence of the Civil War, the fact that slavery was wrong, it should be terminated and all men are created equal and now they're given the right to vote. Wilmington was the city on the hill. But the, the Secret Nine and the Democratic Party decided that that was not to be. They wanted to take back their, isn't that interesting? Think about the, the, the uh, election rhetoric of the 2020 and the 2016. They wanted to take back their country. People even use the same terminology. And so the interesting thing about that is that this was a well-planned coup. It was presented to the world as a bunch of angry black people rioting. No. But this was a well-planned coup. And one of the things that they literally looked to do when the, they, when the secret nine got together and they began to connect with the other newspapers. Like, think about today when the news channels are so partisan. You have the, the um, Fox channel and you have CNN. Same thing then. You had the Charlotte paper and the Raleigh News and Observer. And these were like the, the uh, Democratic papers, you would say the racist papers. And you had the uh, Wilmington paper, the Daily Record, which was a, you might say a black owned paper, but a, a fusion paper. Once the newspapers come into play, then you begin to change people's minds. There was an interesting meeting that they had. And basically what was decided was that they wanted people who could speak. They wanted people who could write and they wanted people who could ride. And this was in uh, 19, 1897 when the, the Secret Nine and others around the state said, let us get together people who can write. In other words, they wanted to take control of the news media so that you could control what people read and control their minds and their thoughts. We want to take control of people to speak. They didn't have the internet then. <laughs> and so the speakers were important to go out into the countryside, the great orators, and, and to tell about the story, whatever the story was. And then you needed people who could ride. And these were the red shirts, people who could line up on horseback and could do whatever it took to intimidate others. So in this scenario, as things began to change, these forces came together, the newspapers. And last night, I think Mr. Sullivan was talking about the cartoons. Since they didn't have the internet, the cartoon gave you a visual, you know, everybody, <laughs> they said the leaders were not readers necessarily. And so we're talking a time when many people couldn't read. And so a cartoon, a picture 
conveyed more information than a book could. And so they brought together one of the top cartoonists and they are from, from early uh, 1897, early 1898, a barrage of news articles of cartoons depicting the Negroes as shiftless, as unable to handle things. But Wilmington was the contradiction to all of that. Then it happened. The one thing that they all agreed on was that they needed, and I'm talking the secret nine, the, the white supremacist power structure. The one thing that they all agreed on, they needed an issue that cut across party lines. And that issue was racism, was race, was the black male. And so when uh, Rebecca Fenton had uh, written a, an article and spoke about the fact that so many black men were ravishing and, and raping and you know, terrorizing white women and that the white men were not doing anything about it, Manley felt compelled to write an article responding to that. And his article basically said that every... Uh, Every white woman who claimed to be raped was raped by a black man, and there were many consensual relationships. And that was the spark. That gave the image. So Manley's article was reprinted and cartoonized all over the state. That gave the imagery that they needed of this black brute terrorizing white women which then inflamed everyone, inflamed their passions. And so this is the context that's going on now in 1898. There were literally groups set up, basically uh, white supremacist groups were set up all around the state. And it's interesting, the, 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 the business people, the learned people who had the plan, laid the plan out and basically sucked everybody else in, the red shirts, the different elements who made the plan work. And so Wilmington was the target. Manley had given them the bullseye and their plan executed absolutely. And so the real goal had nothing to do with white womanhood. The real goal, follow the money, follow the power, the real goal was to change the outcome of the election of 1898. That's what it was really all about. Isn't that interesting? Here in 2020, what is the goal? <laughs> to change the outcome of the election. <laughs> now, as a result, that time leading up to that election of November 1898, the white supremacists, they had uh, big rallies in Raleigh. And, and it's interesting as I watched the way that the presidency or the president was doing his rallies, it was like a duplication of what was done then. Can you imagine getting 8,000 people together to rally in North Carolina in a city in North Carolina? They did that <laughs> with no internet. <laughs> and so the, these big rallies were there. And the purpose of the rallies was to inflame people's emotions, to get them fired up. And that's exactly what we just saw in the last election. So these fired up people, their job was to intimidate black folks so that they would not vote and to intimidate the white people who supported them so that they either would not vote or would vote right. You know, there, there came a time in Wilmington when one of these, um, uh, white supremacist groups literally contacted everybody in, in, in town and said, look, every white man in town got to join. If you don't join, we'll run you out of town. And so they literally put together a consensus, a, 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 a group of people whose main job was to keep black people from voting. And so that was really the motivation of 1898. They talk a lot about how many people were killed. And it's interesting, you can never 
whenever you're talking about these race issues, you notice that you can never tell how many people were killed. You look at uh, Tulsa, Black Wall Street, you read it, nobody knows how many people were killed. <laughs> In Wilmington, you talk about 1898, nobody knows how many people were killed. The estimates are somewhere between 60 and 300. But you can document that at least 2,000 educated, you might say the real heart of the black middle class left town. I, when I was doing some research, there was a, a column in the Star News. It, was, it said 50 years ago and 100 years ago. They stopped running it, I think. But it, it, it had a daily count of how many Negroes left Wilmington after 1898. I think one of our prominent churches, uh, St. Stephen's on Fifth and Red Cross, I saw a document once that said they had about 1,200 members in, I think, April of 1898. And by April of 1899, it had reduced to about 341 members. So this 1898 was really about a coup d'etat, a coup to change the power structure that was running, one, the city, which then became a symbol to change the power structure that was running the state, which then became the master plan for the South. One of the things that happened, you know, when, Wil when Wilmington was so very famous, uh, 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 and think about this, by 1898, the first black graduate of MIT was Robert R. Taylor, who graduated in 1888. So in 1884, Wilmington was producing black people who were educated and smart enough to attend MIT and to graduate. So Wilmington was that city on the hill and if they could bring Wilmington down, they could. It was a systematic operation. It covered every facet of the, of the city, of the economics, of the politics, of the culture. Once this happened, once the, the um, Democrats, the new Democrats took over in Raleigh, they began to enact laws that laid the foundation for Jim Crow. One of the messages that, that was received after 1898 was the fact that nobody was coming to help. You know, there had been situations where the federal government had sent troops in to enforce, uh, to make the citizens to enforce the rights of black people. But 1898 sent a signal, the president ignored it. And it was presented as a race riot that where angry black men attacked white people all up and down the street. But that was just a cover for what it really was. When you even look back, so many of the, um, the people who were involved were able to, you might say, were able to get a benefit from it. When we looked at some of the players who instigated this whole 1898 scenario, it's a lot like today. Are you without TV tonight? No. Everybody hear me clearly? We got you. Okay. That as a result of this 1898 experience, most of the main players ended up, ended up becoming a part of the, the after government, the election of, two, of 1900, where they redistricted and the last black man in Congress, uh, George Henry White, was the last black congressman. And when he left office in uh, 1902, there was not another black person in Congress for another 25 years or so. But just looking at some of the players after this coup, Charles Acock, who was one of the main organizers became the 50th governor of the state of North Carolina. He justified the mob violence was this idea that it was about bringing about the rightness of white rule. The White Declaration of Independence 
was a document literally designed to state the claims and state the philosophy of the time. And I know that many of you read it, but there's just one portion I'll, I'll read because it laid out. And this was signed by the prominent citizens of Wilmington, the business and the business, the spiritual, the religious, the cultural citizens of Wilmington. And it opened like this. It said, believing that the Constitution of the United States contemplated a government to be carried on by an enlightened people, believing that its framers did not anticipate the enfranchisement of an ignorant population of African origin, and believing that the men of the state of North Carolina who joined in forming the union did not contemplate for their descendants a subjugation to an inferior race. We, the undersigned citizens of the city of Wilmington and county of New Hanover County, do hereby declare that we will no longer be ruled and will never again be ruled by men of African origin. This condition we have part endured because we felt the consequences of the war of secession were such to deprive us of the fair consideration of many of our countrymen. And it goes on, it laid out a lot like the Declaration of Independence where they enumerate the grievances, but the end result was they actually laid out the foundation for the next 75 years of this country. The people who were main participants rose up in the government and they formed the North Carolina that now we are living through. So ACOC became governor. At that point, the state legislature, legislature put in voting suppression uh, laws, putting uh, poll taxes, put in grandfather clauses, in other words, they eliminated every possibility of a black person voting because they understood that if we believed, if we acted on what we said our country was about, government of the people, and black people were people, then you, they set up laws to disenfranchise them. John Bellamy, who was one of the orators, became a U.S. senator and a U.S. congressman. Josephus Daniels, the publisher of the Raleigh News and Observer, was appointed Secretary of the Navy by Woodrow Wilson. He was close friends with Franklin Roosevelt who, who, uh, and became ambassador to Mexico. Mike Dowling, one of the red shirts, became a special police officer. Rebecca Felton, the woman who wrote the initial article that, that uh, Manley re responded to, Rebecca Felton <laughs> was honored with appointment to the United States Senate. She became the first woman to serve in the United States Senate. At that time, the, the, the women had not yet really consolidated their right to vote. She only served for one day, but that was a confirmation by the United States government of the outcome and the process of 1898. Robert Glenn became a North Carolina Senator and the governor of North Carolina and an ordained minister. Tom Jarvis founded East Carolina College. Norman Generet became a, uh, a major financier. Charles Kitchen became a lifetime US Congressman on the Ways and Means Committee. W.W. W. Kitchen served five terms in Congress. And it goes on and on. Cameron Morrison became a governor of North Carolina. George Roundtree became a North Carolina assemblyman who sponsored the legislation to keep blacks disenfranchised. Also co-founder of the North Carolina Bar Association. So I say that to say that this was not a race riot. This was a coup. It was a well thought out, well organized coup that used that one thing in America that is so deep, that, that, that emotion that is so deep and is so powerful, that race baiting emotion to literally change the landscape. Once 1898 took place, then virtually all of the states across the South emulated that model. 
They took the laws that North Carolina had set up to disenfranchise black people. They, I mean, the, the legislature, when you look at some of the things that's going on now, it's so much like it was then. The legislature made laws that took away the power of cities to determine their own destiny. They took away a lot of the elective offices so they could appoint people. They literally created that steel frisk, fist of racist control with designed purpose to one, keep the black man out and two, to consolidate the power. As I said, it's always about the money. And as you know, when we follow the money, slavery, though it was a moral, terrible, a moral sin, was an economic boom. If you can have 300 years of, of free labor, it doesn't matter how dumb you are, you can have, you can get rich. So the main driver of slavery, though it was immoral, was money. And so what 1898 and today teaches us is money. Capitalism is the driving force. In, in researching 1898, there were deals cut where the, the, uh, the industrialists, the railroad people agreed to stand back and do nothing uh, with the agreement that once the Democrats took over, they wouldn't raise their taxes. Doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> so just to progress it all up to today, when we look at the current political climate, what are some of the main foundations? And I'll say a primarily Republican agenda right now. Number one, voter disenfranchisement of black people, black and brown people, but black people in particular. Look at the number of states like North Carolina that enacted voter ID laws and all these different laws to keep black people from voting. If Stacey Abrams had not made it her life mission to get voters registered in, in Georgia after her defeat for governor, then we wouldn't even be talking about uh, Georgia right now being a, a, a possibly a blue state. So right now the same objective of the powers that be in 1898 are the same objective of the powers that be now. One of the reasons for this whole recount, what are they really saying? They're really saying that they want to discount the black vote. It's interesting. It's only a problem when they lose. <laughs> as long as they win, the, all the vote is good. The black vote is good. The white vote is good. Everything is good. But when they lose, all of a sudden the black vote is no good. And so that is happening right now. Everything in Wilmington is happening again. The disenfranchisement of people, of black people, of people of color. Education. One of the things that the Fusion Party had encouraged was free education, free public schools, because they saw the massive job of educating the slaves, the freely, the newly freed, the, the newly freed people. And so education was key. What is happening now? We have charter schools. We have these schools being set up. And it's all about the mind. If you call it a school of choice, you say, well, don't you, wouldn't you choose to have your child go to a good school? Of course I would. But when you understand the philosophy behind it. So once again, we are in the process now of undermining the public education system. Look at the economics, the, the banking, the, the, um, the labor system. That one of the key things one that's really said after 1898, the white businesses advertised to bring Europeans to North Carolina to do the jobs that black people have been doing for 200 years. You have the folks who came over from the Scandinavian countries to bring uh, gladiolas and lilies and, and farm people. And so when we look at how the export of jobs has hurt America. But when you travel up, Sandra and I had gone up into Columbus County and Bladen County, and we remember the days when they had textile companies, when they had companies that manufactured wood, when they had companies that did things. And when the exporting of these jobs impacted the Black community, much more than anybody else. So 
if we look at our future and we look at where we are right now, we can say this, very little has changed. Mm -hmm. It's always about the money. It's always about suppressing the black vote, vote to maintain the money. There's a fear among the white establishment that the black people, when they take over, will do something. I don't know what they think the black folks are gonna do, but if you look at black men have been head of Merrill Lynch, have been head of American Express. They didn't bring everybody and tear the companies down. They built them up. So there's something spiritually going on. And I'll sort of wrap up with this. That when you look at the moral degradation that facilitated slavery, when you consider the fact that many black men and women were hung on Sunday after church, mm -hmm. where congregations of white people watched the hanging. When you at least even think of as late as 2008, when the United States Senate would not have a, a written roll call vote on condemning lynching. When we, at a period where even though we say nobody, I didn't own slaves, I wasn't there. Then what's the problem with apologizing? Mm -hmm. So the spiritual dilemma says this, number one, until we can acknowledge, and what I shared with you, I tried to sugarcoat it as much as I could, because I didn't want to scare you. But when I really, when you really look at what really went down, I gave you the, the vanilla version of it. When you look at the reality, the historical reality and the current reality, we have to acknowledge what it is, acknowledge the truth of it. So when George Floyd dies with a knee on his neck, we get more concerned about somebody burning a building down about, or than about the systemic racism that created that situation. We have to spiritually come together and acknowledge the fact of slavery, of all of this, power grab based on race. We have to ask forgiveness. The Bible tells us, it's all laid out in the Bible, that whenever you have hurt somebody else, you should make first acknowledge it, ask forgiveness. What's the problem with asking forgiveness? All you're saying is, hey, I wasn't there. Maybe I didn't do it, but I apologize on their behalf. I'm sorry. They shouldn't have done it, you know? And then third, to make atonement. And that doesn't necessarily mean reparations, or die, but atonement means how can I make it right? How can I create institutions to make it right? Until we do that, until we take that spiritual approach, we can see that the laws have not worked because the laws change according to the mindset of the people. The courts have not worked. That's been the, the great bat, uh, battle over the superior, Supreme Court is that with a conservative Supreme Court, it can be no different from 1857 with Dred Scott. And the court said a black man has no rights. No different from 1896 with Plessy versus Ferguson with separate but equal. And so the courts haven't worked. If we're ever going to, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, he said that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And until we can until we can acknowledge, confess, and atone, the house that is America will be divided along racial lines as the primary, will be divided along economic lines, secondary, will be divided along cultural lines. And as long as it's a house divided, it cannot stand. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Harris, that was absolutely, that took us on, I feel like that took us on so many facets, so many journeys to really see something that maybe we've never seen before about the larger impact of 1898. Thank you so much. So we wanna we'll open this up for answers. Uh, answers, questions, sorry about that. <laughs> I wanna open this up for questions. If anyone has any, Feel free to type them in the chat or you know responses right now. Um, I'll just leave it, give a moment for folks. I'm raising my hand. Yes, ma'am. Well, please, please uh, do speak. Hi, my name's 
Teresa Rossi and I work closely with Sonia. You know, it seems sometimes that the feeling, I'm not from North Carolina. I'm uh, raised outside of Philadelphia and spent about 20 years in um, the New York City area, in New York City actually. But my question is, is it a heavier, North Carolina feels heavy to me. I, I feel like what happened in 1898 makes a difference or am I just seeing um, what it's like to be in the South more than the North? And I'm not saying that the North isn't better and that the same federal laws don't apply, but I have a sense of the old ways here that I don't in other places, not just in the North, but other places. Teresa, you, there is a sense of heaviness that, you know, what happened in 1898 was a seed. And the Bible says that the seed determines the fruit. And the seed that was 1898 created the fruit that led to Jim Crow, that led to all of the things that we are still fighting in this country today. And so Wilmington might feel a little heavier because this is where that seed was planted. So I, 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 I concur, you do get that feeling. And thank you for the question. I actually wanted to piggyback on that because that was one of my questions as a native Wilmingtonian, you know, having grown up in the segregation era. Um, I, I wanted to know what the impact of 1898 was on your daily life and on the life of your family, the, the Black people that yes. were here. Well, you know, Olivia, and to all of our listeners, I didn't know anything about 1898 and I was not the dumbest doll in the church. I mean, I left, I left Wilmington in 1960 to go to Columbia University. I had gotten a scholarship. I studied and I graduated there. And I really didn't know anything about 1898. Every now and then the old folks would say something about it in hushed terms. But I really didn't know anything about it. But we felt the effects of 1898. And so, in the 1950s, when I was in uh, elementary school and middle school, and even in high school, we knew uh, our parents had to always give us the talk. We had to know how to act, as they, as they used to say, you had to know how to act so you don't get killed. Okay. And so when I went to Columbia, I was being interviewed once and I told them at that point, I think I was 16, I was 16 when I started Columbia. I had never talked to a white person in a conversational mode. Any conversation I'd had was do this, do that, get out of the way, move over here. Boy, don't you touch that water fountain, okay? And so the impact of 1898 is, is right here in my heart because we lived that impact. When JoJo and the fellas went up to a and College and they had to sit in, they had actually tried to sit in a couple of years before in Wilmington, but that old tired playbook, the, once they tried that sit in, the powers that be went to those kids' parents and told them they can't come back out there tomorrow. You don't have to worry about ever working again in life. Those kids did not go back out there. And so that, um, that presence is always there. The March on Washington, 1963, I remember the bus coming up from Wilmington and I saw that bus and all the cities had the names of the cities on them. And I saw Wilmington, North Carolina, man, my heart jumped up and people were there. But the amazing thing was after that March, I had a vision that nothing had changed. And so when we look back uh, from that time, <laughs> nothing had, and it's not, I don't like to say nothing has changed because one of the things that I see now that happened in 1890. One of the things that the white power structure was afraid of in 1898 was that black people were getting power. Mm -hmm. That, you know, when you look at the economic thing, you had the black folks in Wilmington who owned some land, but literally they started from zero. As a slave in uh, what, 
1865, 1866, you, you had nothing wherein white people had been inheriting land for 100, 200, 300 years. So starting with nothing, they had progressed a long ways down the line. With this whole election experience and with the whole George Floyd experience, one of the things that I was surprised, I did not know how many black people were mayors and city councilmen and um, uh, attorney generals and positions of power and authority. And I think that a lot of what's going on with this election is the 1898 playbook through the lens of 2020. It's like just like they didn't like the black people, the, the diverse government in Wilmington in 1898. I'm sure that there's a group somewhere saying we don't like what we see now. And that might be a part of the whole motivation with this whole election and this, 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 this transfer of uh, mindset to the next candidate, to the next president. That was so powerful. Thank you so much. And um, I, I, uh, um, there are questions and responses. People are responding. Thank you all so much. Um, so to, to answer you, Ed, I personally did not go to school here in Wilmington. I lived in New York and would visit. And I was visiting, I'm 27. So I was visiting in the past, you know, 15, 20 years. And my memory was always like, and even now as a full-time resident now, my memory growing up was that even the way that our family talked about going places and, and interacting with people was like, we're gonna interact with the black people here. And then, oh, there's those white people doing the thing they're doing, you know, because even though people might know, there's, a, there's I think for me at least, what was communicated to me was a general distrust of uh, white motives. Like, why are they here? They mm -hmm. want to infiltrate and they're going to take it apart and they're going to do this. And, and you know, with good reason, because it's happened before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it, but growing up and then I went to school, I actually went to Columbia as well. And, you know, it's a totally different time, you know, and diversity, diversity in college is so powerful. Um, diversity of living, like living with people who are not like you. My, one of my best friends from college just came down to visit us from, she, she's a graduate student at Duke University. And she came down on Sunday and she's from, her family's from Iran. And I think we had sat, we sat with her and it was like, wow, we've never, we've never sat families together like this, like people from different cultures being able to just sit and comfortably speak like this. It certainly doesn't happen often in Wilmington, whereas she and I were in school in New York, you know, and for us, that was, that was something we took for granted. Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly. Mm -hmm. There's some here. I see the question about the Wilmington 10. Okay, feel free. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting from uh, Kevin. Yes, very interesting, Kevin, about the Wilmington 10. You know, in 1956, when the school, when the Supreme Court um, made segregation unconstitutional, I was at that time, I think I was in middle school. Yeah, middle school. And we really thought that it was like everything was going to change overnight. We just thought, well, that's the law. It's like, you know, when they tell you it's illegal to drive on the wrong side of the street, you stop driving on the wrong side. We really, as children and in school, we rejoiced because we thought that it was going to be overnight. But in Wilmington, the, the decision was, what, in uh, 1956, and it took until 1968 after a lawsuit. So what we saw was that the mindset was still there. The lawsuit with Dr. Eaton and the other prominent doctors in town, that lawsuit to force them to integrate the schools. Now, the same people that fought the lawsuit on behalf of the Board of Education in the county, after the judge's order came down and the judge ruled against them, they were still in charge. So they did not get a moral capitulation like, oh, I know this is wrong, now I'm clear they still had the same mindset. And so the Wilmington 10, that whole 
thing. I remember interviewing and talking to one of them, and there was an instance where a young man, a, a, I think a, a young white girl had stabbed a young man, and he was charged with getting in the way of her pencil. <laughs> so the mindset was still that racist segregationist mindset. And so the Wilmington 10 just brought it all to a head because the young people, you know, one thing about all you young people, and I have to take my hat off to you, when you read the things in the constitution and the things that we hold dear in our government, you believe them. And you wanna know why is not, this not happening? When you look at all the kids out there, the diversity of, of young people in the Black Lives Matter movement, and I'm sure they'd ever get the same when we read the same constitution. Why is this happening? And so the Wilmington 10 was just the, the sort of the last vestige there of you know that 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 fight against integration. And it just blew up and you know got bigger than ever. But I really salute the governor, I salute the district attorney, John David, when he went back and looked at the court cases where these young men were convicted. He found where they'd made notes on the jury sheet, KKK, <laughs> to make sure they had a, a biased jury to convict him. It's one of the few cases where Amnesty International actually became involved and helped provide money and, and, and support for them because they were going up against the whole government, the city, the state, and probably the government, the federal. And also, uh... Dr. Harris, there was a question from Ed, a further question, which was, what keeps schools like Snipes, Rachel Freeman, et cetera, segregated? Are young people now going to segregated schools within Wilmington? To an extent, you have, you have two dynamics happening. You know, I like neighborhood schools. <laughs> you know, so since the neighborhoods are segregated, the schools are going to tend to be segregated. After all this time, we still live in segregated neighborhoods. And so schools like Snipes and some of the other schools, uh, one, because of the neighborhood that they live in, is going to stay segregated. And then two, you have to look at the structure under which the schools operate. And so you have, for example, you have the charter schools. So that takes out a certain percentage of students. Then you have some of the specialty schools where you have to take out, uh, take a test that takes out a certain percentage of the students. So what's left are often um, can be grouped together as not being able to go to charter schools, not over here, but perfectly good students who have great futures ahead, but they end up in that segregated school. So it's, it's unintentionally intentional. <laughs> De facto, as they say. Yes. Um, and I, I, I wanted to just bring up and highlight something you said at the very end, which I think is still the question that we're all entertaining as we move forward, which is the spiritual approach that you've spoken about. Um, and, and I think you've also written about in the book, but, but this is something I think that's still hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around what that would look like. I can only think of a few places in the world that have done things of this nature, you know, South Africa with apartheid, Germany with the Holocaust. Um, there's, not a, there's not a large group of countries that are willing to deal with the kinds of the, the, their histories, their dark histories and really own them and take, take proactive steps to do something about it. You're absolutely right, Olivia. And when you look at apartheid, I mean, Nelson Mandela stayed in jail 27 years. And all he had to do was say, I disavow, you know, this, this movement that he was a part of. And so when the ideas no longer support the reality, then the spiritual approach really is the only solution. So when after the, the, and once again, we go back to the money, after the countries economically began to isolate South Africa, after, you know, they took out many of the uh, unions and, you know, large investment groups pulled their money out of companies operating out of South Africa. So they really did not have necessarily a moral capitulation, but because you follow the money, it became economically unfeasible to continue. And so at that point, I think the karma, the people who saw 
all the nastiness that had happened said that the only way we can get past this, we got to fess up. Uh, they followed the Bible. The Bible says, hey, when the one person, when one people have wronged another, you've got to acknowledge it, you've got to ask forgiveness, and you got to make atonement. My Bible says it, your Bible says it, and virtually every religion in the world has that same principle there. If we in America refuse to follow that principle, then once again, we're going to stay a house divided. So the I principle know. is there. We just have to have the courage to do it. Well, you know, it's very interesting because what you just said was very, very interesting, which was when has a country or a place ever really morally capitulated? It is something that maybe is, maybe it's unfeasible to ask a group of people to do that, but there becomes a point where, as you said, you follow the money and the economic uh, drawbacks outweigh the economic benefits. And this is a place where I think this is kind of a similar thing of so social currency with social yeah. media where you know, we've spoken about, you and I have spoken about how, how shocked you were to see people protesting in the streets about George Floyd in, I think it was like New Zealand and you were just shocked. Like people mm -hmm. all over the world care about this man who, what? Because mm -hmm. the idea that the world is watching, the world is weighing, the world is not, and the world is not just, um, letting it happen but is actually responding one way or another is an interesting place to to look to 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 create change yes. um, but i also think and and i know that this is something that you did with your community action group that there were concerted efforts to create a totally new relationship in in wilmington Yes. I would love for you, to, I know this is not something you talk about a lot, but I would mm -hmm. love for you to remind folks, some of the folks here I think were even involved, but I would love for you to remind folks and bring that back to life because I think it, it, it continues to inspire me every time mm -hmm. that we discuss it. Well, you know, thank you so much, David. That's an interesting uh, question. When Sandra Spalding Hughes was elected to city council, we learned a lot of things. Sandra won by five votes and uh, on the recount, it grew to six, <laughs> okay? And one of the things that came out of it was our campaign staff was so energized to have a mission, to have a, a, a mission and to have the mission accomplished. And so once she was elected to the city council, people didn't want to quit campaigning. I'm like, the campaign is over. But they, we sat one day, I'll never forget, we sat and we said, well, what was the campaign really about? because the campaign was very diverse, very diverse, white, black, all. So what was the campaign really about? And it was really about all of us coming together with a common purpose to change Wilmington, to make Wilmington more just, to give people more opportunities. And so the community action group would say, okay, well, let's keep that same theme and let's start meeting. We're not gonna meet every week as we did in the campaign, but let's meet monthly. And so the second Monday of each month, we had people come together and we did the work because one of the keys was we always had 150 to 200 people. The fire marshal was very, um, was very patient with us. You know, he just sort of whispered in my ear, you got too many people up in here, okay? But the idea was that people were hungry to come together and talk and to listen. You know, many folks didn't really have anything to say, but they wanted to be in that environment. And so when people came in there on that Monday, that second Monday of every month, uh, we started a community education series to teach people how to get involved with government, how to Robert's Rules of Orders. We got, we got all the parts of the community involved. The, the university came and taught things. The hospital did health, challenge, health things. So what it said was that somebody's got to lead it. I, I call it the Moses principle. The Bible is like a spiritual book and somebody's got to lead it. They can either lead it right or lead it wrong, but somebody's got to lead the people. And so I'm looking for a new leader to come up in Wilmington who can continue that move, continue that vibration and, and do what it takes to make it happen. But that group made a change in the city. It was that, it, it was like 1898. 
because you had white people, black people, Spanish people, all people, rich people, poor people coming together on 7th and Castle every month, <laughs> okay. like clockwork. Mm -hmm. And that is a part of the solution because once we came together, it was a spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. And out of that grew power. You couldn't be a politician and come to Wilmington and not come through the community action group. No matter, Elizabeth Dole, when she was running for US Senate came through there, <laughs> okay? So that was the power of that group. That's the power of the idea of communicating and working together. Thank you so much. So everyone, it is 6.15 PM. I thank you so much for, for rocking with us since, since for some of us from yesterday to today. Thank you so much. Again, I'm Olivia Harris. I wanna thank Sonia Patrick so much for her continued leadership. She is the never ending, what is it? The ever ready bunny. She is the nonstop tireless organizer and supporter of people. I'm gonna close out with this last piece, which uh, Dr. Harris wrote, which is called The Kidnapped African Would Not Die. And I'll read it. Yes, sir. All right. This was written, I was actually in Israel on a mountain and I had a revelation as I was sitting there and wrote it down because Israel is in Africa, by the way. The kidnapped African would not die. As the period of the great captivity draws to a close, there's a deep yearning to reestablish that ancestral connection between Africans of the homeland who were spared the middle passage and the kidnapped Africans who now populate the shores of America. The kidnapped Africans began their involuntary journey into the great captivity, afflicted with the endless horror of being taken in the night from their families and loved ones. They were dragged across the body of Mother Africa in chain, in pain, in fear of a terrible bondage from which there was no escape but death. Mighty warriors were hunted and trapped by godless cowards without valor, respect, or conscience. Descendants of kings and prophets were captured in nets, placed in chains, then subjected to the operation of a coward's vanity and ego. Oh, it must have been some vile, some feeling of vile exhilaration for the vicious slave master to watch proud African men of royal descent broken down, beaten, and tortured to the rhythm of constant pain, systematically inflicted. But the kidnapped African would not die. Beautiful African women were torn from the bosom of Mother Africa, torn from her magnificent breasts and taken across an ocean of tears to a hostile land that gave her no respect or praise. In the new world, the kidnapped African was whipped, tortured, and mutilated into submission or death. Those who survived this cruel destruction of body, mind, and spirit became the slaves of America. This dehumanizing process transformed the kidnapped African into human property to be possessed and used at the whims and fancies of a heartless man. Then the final indignity was inflicted upon the kidnapped Africa. Rewriting this bloody saga of captivity and affliction, the ruthless slave master attempted to close the eyes and minds of these kidnapped Africans to the past and land from which they had been stolen in the night, hiding forever the greatest wrong committed by one people against another. But the kidnapped African would not die. The faint remembrance of the African homeland was buried deep within their souls, deeper than the whip could reach, deeper than the hangman's noose, deep within the bosom of their God. Mother Africa is now calling for her sons and daughters of the captivity to unite once more with the sons and daughters in her bosom to begin again to build again another dream. The kidnapped African who did not die, heeding the call of the eternal mother is now set free to remake the universe in the image of good, in the image of God, in the image of the distant glory from whence we came. For the kidnapped African did not die. Mm. Amen. I know I felt that. I was like, that, that felt like a prayer and a promise. Um, so to all of you who have been here with us, again, I thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I hope that we continue to inspire these kinds of, I, this work is, it is 
it is in a way never ending in the way that growing and, and living really is. It comes, it ebbs and it flows, but we are here to be present with each other and to continue to create and re-articulate our vision for what we see possible here in Wilmington and ultimately here in the world. So I do have this recorded. For those of you who are interested, please do, you can leave your email in the chat and I will make sure that we get that out to you. If you have any other questions and want to reach out or have anything to say, I will, I will put my email in the chat in case you need support with anything. Hold on, I'm gonna just type that here because the, the most important thing to me is that this continues, that the story does not go hidden again for another hundred years, that the story also doesn't stop here, that this doesn't become the end game, that we are ever moving forward and that we continue to create community and continue to keep the faith. So thank you all so very much. Um, I believe that's it. I'm going to leave this open for a little bit so you can, anyone who wants to write their emails or anything else, no problem. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you.
that you could understand. I only wish that you could understand. I only wish that you could understand. I only wish that you would take a stand. Thank you, everyone. So for those of you still there, that song is called Power. That's by me. Uh, I go by the name Olivia K. As a performer, as I said, I'm a musician and a community community worker of art. So thank you again. Thank you again, again, again to Sonia and the whole community who put this together. And hopefully we will continue this in the future. Everyone be blessed.